Welcome everyone. My name is Sierra Sanchez and I'll be helping to produce this conversation. The webinar will begin in just a moment, but before then I'd like to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat box and to share any questions you might have in the Q&A box. All resources, slides, and a recording of the session will be emailed to you following the close of the conversation. And we will be posting a brief on-screen evaluation during close and highly encourage you to respond. This helps us with our commitment to continuous improvement. Joining you now is Malai Amfar, Senior Consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Sierra. Uh, hello and welcome to everyone. Uh, this is our last Crucible of Practice webinar of 2022. So I'm really happy that you're able to join us today. Uh, and over the next 90 minutes, we have something truly special uh, for all of you. Uh, United Wave serves more than 1,100 communities across 37 countries and territories worldwide. Uh, the logo is instantly recognizable and synonymous with community impact in health, education, and financial stability. The work of United Way is fueled by volunteers and passion within the local community, as you all know, uh, to ensure well-being for all. As a funder and player within the philanthropic sector, United Ways offer resources and support for local program partners. And it's no surprise when the campaign for grade level reading initially formed a decade ago, United Way was there. In fact, United Ways make up the greatest percentage of backbone agencies in our network and continue to be an important uh, national and local partner to our shared work. So in today's webinar, we will hear the story of how the largest United Way in Iowa approaches their education pillar and how this also aligns as the backbone organization for their CGLR coalition. We have a full panel and I invite you to access their bios and the link that I will soon place in the chat. And today, uh, if you could please, Sarah, advance the slides just a, a little bit, you can see the faces of those that we're gonna hear today. Uh, like I said, we have a full, uh, full panel. So at this moment, it is my pleasure to start our session by introducing Mary Sellers, President of United Way of Central Iowa. Mary has held this position from 2012 to 2017 and rejoined uh, in the Des Moines team in July of 2021. During the interim period of 2017 to 2019, she served as U.S. President of United Way Worldwide, leading the U.S. network of 1,200 local United Ways. So it is truly my pleasure uh, to introduce Mary. Uh, Mary, I don't think you know this, but I came from a United Way, so uh, very excited to have this conversation. It's my honor to, to welcome you. Uh, Mary will begin our session by sharing the evolution of United to Thrive in Central Iowa. Go ahead, Mary. Great. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of the team here at United Way of Central Iowa. I want to first say thank you to the campaign uh, for hosting today and thank you, Malai, uh, for facilitating the conversation. I know we um, here at United Way of Central Iowa always learn so much when we get together with our colleagues and we're hoping that you might find something of interest in the work we're doing here in our community. So with that, uh, I'll just uh, jump in. Um, if we could just advance, I think it's two slides, or to slide two. There you go. That's great. Thank you. So this slide really is just um, establishing the role that United Way of Central Iowa plays in our community. To the far right, you can see United Way in the center of the sectors and those with lived experiences. So we really occupy a unique role in our community where we connect with the corporate sector, the nonprofit sector, the public sector, and those with lived experiences. And with that unique vantage point, we're able to scan the community, we're able to see the gaps, we're able to see the leverage points, and then bring the community together to address uh, the critical issues that we face. Um, on the next slide, um, I wanted to talk a little bit um, about the evolution of United Way of Central Iowa. Uh, not unlike many of you, I'm guessing, um, historically, most of the 105 years we've been serving our community, United Way of Central Iowa was really focused internally, um, funding agency partners' missions. Then when the goals for 2020 were declared, it was a massive shift from looking inward and funding missions 
to looking outward at community level change and funding programs that could help us reach those community level goals, collective impact. Whereas the shift to collective impact was a massive change, the shift for United Way of Central Iowa from the goals for 2020 to United to Thrive is a bit more of an evolution. Uh, goals for 2020 uh, were centered on the foundational needs in our community, whereas United to Thrive is really focused on growth, progress, and thriving. Uh, for example, our income work and in goals for 2020 was focused on self-sufficiency, the minimum amount an individual or a family needs to meet their basic needs. With our evolution to economic opportunity, we're focused not only on self-sufficiency, but on building wealth, assets that can be transferred from generation to generation. Uh, goals for 2020 were very much centered on a destination, whereas United to Thrive has elements of aspiration and destination. All Central Islands are thriving is our aspiration. It's the North Star of what we're calling our strategic imperative. While our strategies and the outcomes we measure within each of the elements are examples of destinations. Uh, goals for 2020, uh, we're very much about longitudinal definitive goals, increase the graduation rate over the course of 10 years. Whereas now with the unprecedented times we're in, um, with uncertainty so prevalent, we need to be more nimble, more agile and reflective of and responsive to our community. So now it's more about responsive measurable progress rather than setting a goal for 10 years in the future. Our world is so much different now, and it's just not responsible for us to try to define a clear destination that is 10 years down the road when the landscape continues to change, not over the course of decades as it has historically, but over the course of years and even months. Also with the goals for 2020, we were very focused on impact. And by default, uh, we, were, we were funding large-scale organizations that served many people in order to make that impact. Whereas with United to Thrive and our focus on equity, we're funding at scale and at a granular level, both geographically and culturally. So for instance, this past year, we funded 45 what we call new and emerging partners that are trusted leaders for either specific populations or specific neighborhoods that our historic large-scale funding partners couldn't necessarily serve effectively or in the same way. I think another important distinction is that the goals for 2020 were much more of a strategic focus. We are focused on this finish line in 10 years, Whereas United to Thrive, we have declared as a, as a strategic imperative, a fist on the table for our community to come together and ensure all Central Iowans are thriving. Uh, another place that we're evolving is that historically, we've been addressing disparities and barriers in our community. I think that's why we were all uh, originally founded as United Ways, I would think. Uh, now, as we, United Way of Central Iowa, are evolving to not only continue to address disparities and barriers, but also to strengthen uh, what we do around fostering an equitable, engaged, and empowered community. So I want to I wanna touch a bit on uh, what you see here in the middle of this graphic um, of United to Thrive. Um, it is meaningful and I just want to explain uh, why it's so meaningful and, and it's really resonated with our community. So puzzle pieces are so fitting in so many ways for what United to Thrive represents for United Way of Central Iowa. A puzzle is by nature challenging, but there is a solution. It may be complex and there may, may be many parts, but every puzzle has a solution. And so do the challenges our community faces. And a puzzle is made up of hundreds, if not thousands of tiny pieces. But to find the solution, sometimes you have to take a step back and look at the picture on the box. You have to focus on the big picture 
in some cases to solve a puzzle. And that is United Way's unique role in our community. We bring focus on the big picture and how the pieces all come together to form a solution. And just like a puzzle, every single piece is important. So you can't solve a puzzle unless you have every piece. So while bringing focus on the big picture, we're also looking toward finding every piece and we can't solve a puzzle without that. And we cannot thrive as a community without making sure every single person in central Iowa has an opportunity to thrive. And finally, uh, just like a puzzle, every piece of our work is connected to every other piece. Every impact that we can make to improve lives in central Iowa improves lives for everyone in our community. Every time that we can help someone overcome a challenge, it has impact on every other challenge that person might be facing. Uh, the example that you see to the left of this uh, slide demonstrates that. If we can help a single mom find quality affordable childcare, it's good for her child, good for that child's future as a student, good for that family's ability to earn a living wage, have access to healthcare and so on. If we help a person get their high school diploma with a plan for the future, it's good for their mental health, good for their economic prospects, good for their families, their household, their neighborhoods, their community. It's all connected. So in the center here, you can see the five elements of United to Thrive, essential needs, early childhood success, education success, economic opportunity, and health and well-being. Connected to each element in the center is equity. Our work must focus on not only eliminating the barriers and equities, as I said, that make uh, thriving in our community and in our society more difficult for some than others, but we have to focus on advancing equity. And finally, in this graphic, you can see all the members of our community uh, coming together to help put the pieces together to solve the puzzle that will lead to a thriving community. We know it's going to take each of us and it's gonna take all of us to make progress toward that thriving community we all aspire to. So it, it's kind of fun actually to be talking about our work with our uh, United Way colleagues who also may have made the shift to collective impact and now are evolving beyond goals for 2020 or some similar framework because I think you'll see and hopefully appreciate the subtlety of the goals for 2020 embedded in our new strategic imperative, United to Thrive. So I'm just gonna touch briefly uh, on the headlines for each of these five uh, air elements that we're focused on. So uh, the first, essential needs. In order to thrive, Central Iowans need not only food and shelter, goals for 2020, um, but reliable access to quality, nutritious food and a safe place to call home. Growth, progress, thriving. Early childhood success, our youngest Central Iowans need not only access to childcare, but access to safe, reliable, affordable childcare to be healthy and ready to learn. Education success, Central Iowa students need not only to graduate from high school, but should also have the opportunity to graduate with a plan for the future. Economic opportunity, Central Iowans need not only to be self-sufficient, but to be financially stable and have the opportunity to build wealth for their family and future generations. Health and well being. Central Iowans need not only access to medical care, but access to quality, reliable, culturally appropriate care that promotes their physical and emotional well being. So, that is a very high level uh, look at uh, our evolution from goals for 2020 into United to thrive, it's very broad strokes um, for what my colleagues will be walking through in the great work that they're not only leading, um, but working with others to integrate throughout our organization and throughout our uh, community. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to our newly appointed Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer, Ruben Vasquez, um, to build a bit about, upon our collective efforts in equity. Ruben? Thank you, Mary. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having us here today. I'm excited to share a little bit about our role in equity, as Mary was talking about, as how it relates to our um, United to Thrive. But before I do that, let me just share a little bit about who I am, uh, because I think it's also important to for everybody to know um, a little bit about myself. Um, 
I am actually a transplant uh, from the Twin Cities to Iowa, moved to Iowa specifically for this role uh, three months ago. So fairly new to, to Iowa, to the Des Moines area, to, to the organization. Um, I've been in the Twin Cities for 43 years. And prior to that, my family and I, um, we actually immigrated to the Twin Cities from Mexico City 43 years ago today, actually. Today is our um, 43rd anniversary living in, the, in this country. Um, and what drew me to this work here in Iowa um, was really a combination of a lot of things. Um, but really is my passion for continuing to build and bring my both my pro professional, but more importantly, my lived experience to this work in communities that are looking to continue to build on this work. And one of the things that attracted me to United Way of Central Iowa is um, after doing quite a bit of research on my end and having conversations with several people, it was clear to me that this organization is really um, very intentional about the work that they want to do on how to continue to build equity and literally embed equity in everything that they do. So um, I don't need to um, tell everybody what happened in 2020, both with the pandemic, but also <laughs> more importantly with the murder of George Floyd. Um, having been in Minnesota in the Twin Cities when that happened, that had a significant mm -hmm. impact on me and my family um, and really uh, understanding and realizing the work that needs to be done throughout the community, um, you know, all over the country. So um, it is because of that work that I came to this community, to this organization, is to continue to build on, uh, on the work that this organization is already doing. So you know, as, as Mary mentioned, equity is at the center of everything that we do. Everything is connected uh, uh, to everything that we do. If you look at this uh, puzzle figure, um, you know, it, it really is. We can't do one without the other, and equity does need to be at the center of everything. So some of the things that we are doing is really focusing the work both internally as well as externally. So we can't really go out into the community and talk about equity if we are not looking at ourselves internally as well and doing that work ourselves. So, um, you know, that's that's one of the things that we have started to do uh, internally is really be intentional about what does equity even mean for us internally? How does that relate? Uh, how do we speak to it? How does that connect to all of our uh, five elements? So there's still a lot of work that needs to be happening um, internally, but again, we are uh, moving forward, um, you know, in, in that work. Um, I share a story that really resonates with me about how intentional the organization is really thinking about some of these issues. And the story I, sh I have shared with my colleagues here in the organization is on my first day, one of the first things I noticed uh, coming in was that I have been in the professional field for many, many years, almost 30 years now. And this is the first organization that actually has gotten my name correctly, spelled correctly. Um, my name has an accent over the E in, in my first name and over the A in my uh, the first part of my last name. And this organization literally took the time and invested whatever they needed to invest to get it right. And I know that for a lot of people, that is probably very insignificant. It's not a big deal. But when I have been fighting over and over in every organization on asking people to spell my name correctly, and this organization really gets it, um, and they actually took the time to do it, that really showed me that this organization realizes that even though there's still a lot of work to do because it is a journey, that they are very intentional of getting it right. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we're not gonna make mistakes because I also believe that through mistakes is how we learn, um, but we are working towards um, a model that is not only a strategic model of building equity internally, but also more importantly, a model that is sustainable so that whenever 
um, any of us um, move away from our roles within United Way of Central Iowa, that model can continue to move forward. The next person can continue to be to build on it um, and it can continue to thrive. So our work is really more about the long-term sustainability of how does equity get embedded in everything that we do, uh, not just uh, a portion of it. So just a little bit of the work that we are doing internally, um, that will translate to how we relate to our external community, whether it's our donors, our partners, just our community in general. Um, but again, it's really focusing more on doing the work ourselves, uh, moving, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done at a systemic level to say, to make some of these changes. But in order to do that, it is our intent to also do it work, to do the work um, as an individual. So we're looking at this work from three pillars, the individual, the institutional, and the systemic, to really be able to make um, a difference and a change in our community where our community does not just can be successful, but can actually be uh, thriving. So with that, I'm actually going to turn it over now to my colleague, Kate, who will kind of talk a little bit about the work that we are doing in early childhood and um, show some examples of how this work is being embedded into everything that we do. Thank you, Ruben. And thank you, Mary. Um, I wanted to just go back a little bit to what Mary was alluding to and her remarks about how we evolved from United to Thrive, from um, the goals for 2020 to United to Thrive, because uh, it really was quite the change. Um, when we were doing our goals for 2020, we started in 2008, and our high school graduation rate was sitting at 83.4%. And um, we were laser focused on increasing that with a goal of increasing it to 95% by 2020. We got close. Um, we reached our peak right as the pandemic hit at 93.6%, which was amazing progress. Um, we had almost a 10% increase in our community, which consists of three counties and 20 school districts. Um, a 10% increase for children of color in graduation rate over that time, which was um, something we were really proud of. I have, I believe we could have gotten to the 95% um, had we not been hit with COVID. But the point of all of that is, as we looked at what was beyond 2020 and what became United to Thrive, our world changed so dramatically. So not only were we looking you know, internally at what's next for United Way of Central Iowa, it just became so clear that we needed to um, not only look at equity, because as you all have probably experienced in your communities, uh, communities of color were hit with by the pandemic harder, um, not to mention the racial justice issues that were arising. We just couldn't ignore the role of equity but we also couldn't ignore um, the role of, or the, the effect on some of our youngest citizens. So as we began to think about what does the education piece of United to Thrive look like, we knew that we needed to really purposefully focus on early childhood success. And that component of early childhood success needed to uh, include a strong health component because so much of, as the campaign, you know, believes and talks about so much of children's young development um, is related to health. So that is our Central Iowa Children Start Out Healthy and Ready to Learn is the mantra for our early childhood success area. So if you want to go to the next slide, I can kind of show this is our overall education cabinet structure. Obviously we have our board of directors, executive committee finance audit. Then you can see there um, kind of the structure of the five elements and how those play out. But the reason for showing this slide, as you can see, um, we have two affinity groups that are housed within education, which means we have groups of donors that are giving to those specific causes. You're going to hear from Jacqueline in a few minutes that's gonna talk specifically about Women United 
And then we also have an ELI, Education Leadership Investment Committee. That group is focused on primarily investments for middle school, but um, looking at the transition years, both in and out of middle school and the difficulty that those provide. So having this um, kind of expanded structure for education has really allowed us to be more comprehensive in the way we look at education and really focus in on the um, early grade reading, you know, that kind of K through three crosses over both. And we've known as we've been working in education that third grade reading has a strong correlation with high school graduation, all of those facts, but um, it wasn't necessarily represented in our uh, structure prior to the creation of United to Thrive. So we knew that we wanted to move beyond a singular goal, you know, for all the reasons that Mary shared. And we wanted to most importantly, um, directly impact the children that were most impacted by the pandemic, which were children zero to eight. Um, they would have missed the most early schooling. Many of them were in childcare. Uh, our our childcare in Iowa, we lost 30% of our childcare and we have some of the highest rates of parents working. So all of it kind of rolls together in the education framework. And our new structure is representative of, of that. So you can go to the next slide. And this shows the strategies that are in early childhood success. I'm sure many of them will be recognizable to you all as you probably have similar things, but wanting to really get in and I, and hopefully you'll see the natural places that equity comes to play in these, which weren't as spelled out in our prior goals for 2020 structure. So addressing barriers to prenatal care, improving birth outcomes, um, increasing access to early identification, promoting physical, healthy physical and mental development, increasing access to participation, quality childcare and preschool, and you'll hear more about that from Jacqueline. And then our advocacy work. Um, Childcare advocacy is a huge part of what we do here and Dave will speak to that. So as we move forward with our early childhood success work, we know that early grade reading is a big part of that. We have a national, or we have a um, internal strategy called Read to Succeed, which really incorporates many of these elements. We provide opportunities for our community to engage in this work through giving, through advocacy, through volunteering. We have opportunities that companies can do. We have a day of action that's focused around um, reading to children. So we're just really trying to lift up the importance of reading and literacy and um, lead with that, you know, it's all of our responsibility. It's a community responsibility to get kids reading on grade level by the end of third grade. So with that, I will turn it to Jacqueline and Jacqueline is going to talk to you about our affinity group that I just referenced, Women United. Great. Thank you, Kate. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jacqueline Wolfkohl. I am the Women United Director at United Way of Central Iowa, which Kate mentioned is our affinity group uh, that donors are able to uh, kind of better align their giving, advocating, and volunteering to a specific uh, mission of ours. Women United was started greater than, or this is our 20th year anniversary in our community that really came out of about 30 plus women coming together, had been involved in United Way of Central Iowa's work and wanted to find a way to put their dollars to better use. And after extreme research and volunteering, advocating and participating in our community, looking for the needs that best aligned with this group, uh, early childhood supports, really rose to the top, focusing on ages zero to eight. Uh, so we now in our 20th year have over 500 donors that are electing to give their dollars uh, one step further than our United Way campaign by checking a box saying it'll go to Women United, that their dollars will support 
uh, programs that we are working closely with that are, are based on that zero to eight age group. When you think about some of those programs in our community, it is quality childcare and reading programs. So we are really fortunate that our donors and community has supported this initiative, has wanted to get more involved. So beyond just their dollars committing to that specific agenda item, they are able to put their time and talent into the work as well. So we have volunteer opportunities in our child care centers that are receiving funding to do our signature program called Book Buddy, which is a weekly mentorship program with four-year-olds getting ready to go to kindergarten on a weekly basis for a school year. And they receive a free book along with each one of those. Uh, the members of Women United are able uh, to serve on volunteer committees and decide events, oper networking opportunities, and kind of the involvement strategy for the donor group to continue to raise funds for our mission and volunteer sit on an investment committee that reviews annually how our dollars are helping support uh, the, the quality items and investments in our funded program. We go to the next slide. I have an example uh, of a partnership that has come up and we were seeing a need for some additional supports for uh, a team of our low income centers and really put together what is called an equip team to help be a resource to the centers in central Iowa for those families that are facing multiple barriers. Uh, affordable childcare being one of them, navigating the system to receive DHS dollars or grant dollars, receiving literacy supports. So you can see on the screen the list of supports that a team of six that is uh, supported by United Ways, Women United, are able to go to a coalition of centers and provide these supports for them. So the literacy supports we do, as Kate also mentioned, we have kits that we ask our whole community to make that we're able to give back that provides activities and learning, learning and reading uh, engagement. There's developmental screenings, both for literacy and any developmental challenges the child may be experiencing, mental health screenings for the children. Uh, they help with the centers to go through any grant processes, federal state reimbursement programs, uh, anything that more than one center is experiencing, it has allowed uh, for it to really flow from center to center and be a support to make sure that uh, the director that may be handling all of those things is, is able to keep that center open. Kate also mentioned the statistic on uh, centers closing in Iowa, greater than 30% have closed in the last five years. We are thrilled to say that with our supports, they ours have stayed open um, through the pandemic, have been able to, to impact our families, uh, making sure that parents can still go to work uh, and kids have a quality, safe space to be every day where mom and dad know that um, they can be supported throughout the day. So as we look forward, we continue to hear of the challenges of the development uh, challenges that experienced during COVID. So adding additional literacy supports, screenings. The goal is that these kids that are going through that fourth grade classroom that receive the screenings are ready to start kindergarten. Uh, that if there is barriers that need to be addressed, they can be addressed going with a plan to our public school district of going into kindergarten to help ensure that they are, we're helping those kids be ready to learn and the teacher is able to spend her time teaching that the, we already know the, the barriers um, that may be faced. So we continue to use advocacy as a platform for our Women United and that is a draw to be a Women United member is to utilize our voice and elevate issues that our state is facing, that our community is facing, and our families are facing uh, to the state level. 
we're fortunate that the Capitol is a hop, skip, and away from our or from our front door here. So we have the chance on a yearly basis to really raise some important issues and bring them to our Capitol, uh, which then leads me to introducing our advocacy officer, Dave Stone, who really leads that work and can dive in greater. So Dave. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dave Stone, and I'm the advocacy officer as well as registered lobbyist for United Way of Central Iowa. And I wanted to take a moment to go through a bit of our advocacy program, provide you with an overview of what we're working on and how you can uh, grow or start an advocacy program of your own. So we'll go ahead to the next slide. I wanted to start out with just some level setting. Um, about the differences between advocacy and lobbying. Um, this is a, an issue that comes up a lot for nonprofits um, that we believe that we can't lobby. And in fact, my message overall is that you can. Uh, first and foremost, that advocacy is about informing on your topics that are mission focused. So you're really in, informing, educating policymakers, uh, you're sharing what the actual problem is, even some solutions. But when you're doing that, you're advocating. And all of us um, advocate every day, whether it be for yourself, your family, uh, for your organization, what have you. But oftentimes this feels like some of the, the top level volunteer work, the top level um, work that staff can or cannot do. Uh, we absolutely can do advocacy. When it comes to lobbying, um, again, nonprofits can lobby with a 501c3 tax status uh, that is determined by the IRS. And what the key note is uh, that you cannot, as a 501c3, spend more than 49% of your overall operating budget on direct lobbying activities. Uh, even our United Way, with having a staff person on board who does this, we come nowhere close to this threshold. And so it is an allowable activity. What lobbying actually is, is a little step above advocating. Um, we've already identified the problem. We've informed and educated our legislators on an issue. We're really technically only lobbying when we're asking for a policymaker to take specific action on a piece of real legislation. Uh, so if I want to talk about affordable housing or child care, I'm advocating, but I'm not lobbying until I say, Senator, I need you to vote yes or no on Bill 4233. That's the only time in which you're actually actively lobbying. 501c3s can do both. Now, there are some um, instances in which your nonprofit may not be allowed to advocate or lobby, and that may mostly be related to grant sources. There are certain grants from both the federal and state levels that specifically bar advocacy and lobbying um, in those contracts. Um, however, I would even caution you just because your organization may receive a federal or state grant that bars lobbying, it may not actually be a blanket block to your entire organization. It really may just be to those staff that are being paid out of that cost center. Uh, and so that's a, a caveat that I always like to share with folks. Oh, we have a state grant. We can't lobby. You can. Um, you just can't do so under that grant. And you certainly can't do so if those staff are paid through that grant. So that's just sort of a brief overview. Again, all of our nonprofits can do both advocacy and lobbying to a limited degree, um, but let's go into what makes effective uh, work in this space. Effective advocacy uh, is really kind of a, a structure built off of uniqueness. Um, us as a United Way, we are an umbrella organization with relationships at the grass tops, relationships at the grass roots, and also with the funded partners that are doing the frontline work every day. Uh, as an umbrella organization for nonprofits in our region, we do occupy this unique space in which we kind of straddle both sides of the funding world as well as the service delivery world and have the data, the unique stories and relationships with our folks that provide that, again, uniqueness. Being a trusted resource is important. And where I put this is in your data collection and in your research. Ensuring that um, you are solid on what you're sharing with policymakers is essential. Um, it's better to go, you know what, I don't have the answer to that question. Uh, let me get back to you on that than um, just making up something as you go. We like to make sure that our data that we put forward is solid, that
that it can be trusted, and we can serve as, a, in, a, in effect, a consulting shop providing those resources to policymakers. Are they curious about uh, what is the child care situation in their district? We can spend time to look at that micro level to provide them with a report or data around uh, what their constituents are facing. With our 211 resource and referral line, which we run here in the state, we can even get more granular and talk about what the, the unmet needs are uh, for certain populations here in our state at a district level or a city or county level. And that sort of develops that trusted resource component. A consistent relationship is important as well, not only in the part of our organization, our leadership, myself with policymakers, but our advocates as well. We can't just fly in, uh, visit with a legislator once and expect them to uh, know who we are, uh, ask them to do what we're doing and uh, maintain that relationship. So having consistent, regular uh, contact with your policymakers of all levels, uh, updating them about the work, it doesn't always have to be about an ask. It could just be giving you a lay of the land of what's happening in your community uh, or elevating an issue that you know um, the community is facing that needs immediate attention. Related to this, we have to have strong advocates and that's where you go to your grassroots as well as your grass tops. Um, in my world, I believe that it is the responsibility of every stakeholder of an organization to have a hat that includes advocacy from your board down to your, your volunteers and donors. Um, they've already made the effort of um, buying into your mission, uh, potentially funding your work uh, in terms of board members. They've taken on a fiduciary responsibility for your organization. Being strong advocates for your organization is a part of that role. And that also means helping and guiding and training those advocates. Uh, they don't know this stuff. I'm a policy wonk. I can talk about a lot of these issues all day, but they don't know the details. They don't know the, the getting in the weeds, if you will. And so providing um, concise uh, and easily digestible materials to your advocates so they can quickly understand the, the, the problem and your proposed solutions. They don't have to get down to the granular level of we need to adjust this fund category in this state or federal program. They need to understand the problem and understand the shallow or top level issues of the solution, but being consistent in that. It's my final point. One of the best ways of being successful is making sure that all of our advocates are armed with the same message, understand that problem at a, at a a, a, a deep enough level for advocates and then being able to articulate that in the solution. It's creating the problem and the value proposition for our policymakers. And so making sure that all of our advocates are singing out of the same hymnal is critically important so that that message is consistent. Um, it, we will have no effectiveness if some advocates are saying one thing while others are saying another. We all have to be on the same page. Next slide, please. As Jacqueline already mentioned um, about Women United, really this is where our work in advocacy was born out of. Um, our, our cabinet groups, our investing cabinets, as well as our affinity groups uh, were definitely funding child care issues. And in around 12, 2006 realized we're, we're largely throwing good money after bad, if you will, if we don't really look at systems change. Um, our, our child care centers were reporting at that time that kiddos who were leaving child care were not school ready um, to go into pre-K or kindergarten. And so some of the early work that we worked on was um, creating a statewide school readiness assessment uh, that we still uh, administer to kids today and that we still rely on for data needs to really understand whether in the zero to five space we are preparing kiddos for school and education success. That also helped inform uh, the statewide voluntary preschool program that also still is in, exist in existence today and is run. Um, this is really where it came from. Our volunteers and their donor and the donors that they are decided to uh, do more with their contributions by coming together and creating our first advocacy coalition. From there, we have now infused advocacy throughout our organization. Um, part of the United Way ethos is give, advocate, and volunteer. However, making sure that advocacy is a key part of our work has to start at the board level and go all the way down to the mission work on the front lines. To that end, um, next slide, please. It is a part of our develop, uh, agenda development process. And so 
beginning each year in June and wrapping up quite literally this week uh, is how we start our uh, agenda setting process. And it comes from the community first. Uh, we go to our community members and, under, and, and listen and learn in a series of conversations about what are the pinch points, whether they be in lived experience individuals, clients, or nonprofits that are experiencing uh, barriers to mission success. Is it regulation? Is it red tape? Is it funding needs? Um, this also comes from our coalitions, these ideas. We have a, 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 an aspect of our work called the Opportunity Plan, which has work groups built on different topic areas. And we do a, a series of conversations with each of those work groups to understand from their lens, what are the areas that we need to be advocating for? And then finally, our funded partners as well. Again, what are those areas that um, we can help alleviate barriers to their mission success uh, and work on? All of these areas kind of go into a large soup pot. Um, we oftentimes have 30, 40, 50 policy ideas, and we have to win out that. And that's really where our public policy cabinet comes into play. This is a cabinet level committee at our organization. Uh, again, infusing that throughout the organization, uh, my cabinet chair sits on the executive committee and the board of directors for our organization uh, to make sure that there, are, there is a champion at each level uh, discussing the work in this space. The Public Policy Committee is made up of uh, advocates in the education, nonprofit, business community, labor world, as well as community uh, advocates. And we use that as sort of a cabinet of adversaries to really refine this agenda down. What is possible and feasible given the environment? What it, do we have capacity for at United Way? And are we really the best uh, to lead, defer, or support this work? Uh, because with so many, um, organizations, programs, and issue areas that we, we cover, it is hard to uh, really stay focused on key priorities. It's easy to dilute your work to the point where you're not able to spend enough time on any one issue to get any progress made. When that process completes, and we completed that in October, uh, the public policy cabinet comes out with basically a refined agenda that we take through our board and executive committee levels. And we'll be doing that this uh, with our board this week. Uh, as we inform our legis uh, excuse me, inform our stakeholders at those levels and also have the input and feedback from, again, our, our closest stakeholders. And then finally, we start launching this community to the community. And we do so this week, Friday, we will launch at our advocacy forum um, at a breakfast here that's being held in person in Des Moines, where we invite uh, the community, our volunteers, our advocates and policymakers to come learn about the issues we'll be promoting in the following calendar year. So for 2023. That event is this Friday, and we'll be launching um, around two main issues, childcare uh, and also workforce housing will be the areas we highlight and prioritize. During legislative session, but also keeping in mind that we advocate at the local, county, state, and federal level, so not just confined to legislative session in Iowa, which runs from uh, January to June. Um, we do promote this through a series of lobby days. Um, now that's opportunities to engage our grassroots advocates and policymakers in person to have conversations about the support that they have for the issues we're promoting. But then pivoting with that as well, we do direct and grassroots advocacy. Lobby days in many instances are for show, uh, for the photo ops, for the visuals, to help our policymakers and our advocates to connect. But oftentimes it's the quieter conversations with just a handful of advocates or myself as staff going in with policymakers that get a lot of the work done. So it's great to have a big event on a Tuesday, uh, but sometimes just a small group meeting on a Tuesday afternoon can have just as much effect. Next slide, please. Uh, on this slide, this is our last year's advocacy agenda broken down by our five issue areas in the United to Thrive uh, ethos. Uh, and so we do vote create priorities in each of our focus areas, and then elevate one to three to four priorities that we're really gonna focus our work on. Um, anyone may scan this QR code on the left-hand sc uh, screen here to learn more about our work, to see some of the work that we've done that's kind of evergreen on our website that allows our advocates to engage with us on an on-demand in a way where they learn the, inf the issues for themselves through video trainings or what have you, and then can engage with their policymakers that way. 
You can also join our advocacy update newsletter, which is sent every Friday weekly during legislative session, which gives a, uh, a perspective of human services needs in the Iowa State uh, General Assembly as it happens. And I believe uh, that may be my final slide. I think so. Yes. So now I'm going to turn it over to my coworkers, Marion and Rachel, who are going to talk about uh, how we do data collection and our measures of success. Thank you all. Hey. Hello, everybody. Yes, we're going to talk about now some measurement. And I think we can all agree that to be good stewards of our donors' dollars, there has to be accountability. Um, if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, um, we can talk about results-based accountability, also known as RBA. So this was adopted by our organization as a data-driven decision-making process to measure impact when United Way moved to that collective impact. Um, it's a simple common sense framework um, that's really easy for anyone to understand. And if you wanna do a little deeper dive, uh, this was developed by Mark Friedman and it's described in his book, Trying Hard is Not Good Enough. So you'll see that with RBA, it encompasses both population and performance accountability. So that population accountability, it organizes and aggregates the work that's being done by all of our funded partners to promote community well-being. It's that collective impact. Um, our population is our three county area. There's also performance accountability. This organizes the work that's being done by our funded partners to demonstrate the impact on clients within these organizations. So the work being done for all of our clients by all of our funded programs contributes to our community impact. Each organization's contributing in their own way to get us closer to that whole population result that we want to see. If you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, so in early childhood success, we state what we want for our community with our result. Central Iowa children start out healthy and ready to learn. And how do we measure the progress we're making toward our result? That's through those indicators. These are basically those metrics that we track for our three county area. And how do we improve on those indicators? That's through our identified strategies. So we fund partners that are doing the work within all of these strategies. And Rachel's going to talk a little bit more about how we measure that impact of our funded partners. Thanks, Marion. And I just wanna, if we wanna go to the next slide, I wanted to take a step back and just talk about some of the different places that we go to get our data. So data is a huge driver in our work. We pull from a lot of different places to get a really robust snapshot of how the community is doing. So it's not just the handful of indicators that um, you saw on the previous slide, but we're going to the Census Bureau to get childhood poverty data. They just did another release last Thursday, so we're excited about that. Um, it's also where we find out how Iowa is ranking with the percent of both parents in the workforce. We get data from the State Department of Public Health. Um, so that's where we find our infant mortality information. I'll share a slide in just a little bit uh, that shows how, um, what numbers we're using for that. We also get data from our State Department of Education. They have a ton of great information available publicly, but we also submit data requests for some of those different key points. So chronic absence, kindergarten readiness, um, getting that information disaggregated again so we can use that equity lens to really see where the disparities are in our community. Where are we making progress? Where do we need to work harder? That type of thing. We also get data from our local school districts. So Central Iowa has 20 different school districts. Um, our largest district, Des Moines Public Schools, has about 30,000 students. So one of the unique things um, that we have is a data sharing agreement with uh, DMPS. So a little bit about how that works. Um, our funded programs complete partnership agreements with the district. Um, those students, participants in those programs are then flagged by DMPS, and we're able to then 
collect information at an aggregate level um, for each of those programs. So we're able to see the number of students that they have data on um, then of those students, how many are chronically absent and how many are failing, of course. So we're able to really get that um, detailed data directly from the school on how our programs are doing. We also get information from our funded partners. So this comes through assessments and surveys and performance measures. Um, so if we pop to the next slide, that is just a um, snapshot back to that public health data. So our infant mortality, we're looking at both central Iowa and Iowa to see how we're doing compared to the state. Um, but then we also collect that disaggregated um, information again, using that equity lens. Moving forward, um, I will look at our community partner focus. So, at United Way, we use Clear Impact Scorecard. Um, a lot of you, other United Ways are probably familiar with this um, because of Global Results Framework and um, submitting data up to United Way worldwide. So we've been using Scorecard for at least 10 years. You're one of the early adopters of it. And I thought it might be helpful um, just to kind of do a really quick um, kind of give you guys an idea of how we're using our scorecard. So this past year, um, moving from goals for 2020 to United to Thrive, we met with every single one of our funded programs um, to really assess and see how are you tracking whether your participants are better off, and then worked really hard to con uh, get some similar language throughout. So we had a lot of different performance measures that were number of students served, kids, children, youth, participants, clients. Um, so having a shared set of definitions really helped us um, in developing an aggregated scorecard so we could see that community level progress. So I am going to share my screen, maybe. All right, so this is our scorecard. Um, so what I really like about scorecard is that for those organizations that have a bit of a larger footprint, so our um, United Way covers three counties, um, but we have a lot of programs that are actually working across the state. So if you have a program um, that has several United Ways that are funding them, um, they're actually able to toggle back and forth between different um, funders to put in their information. Another nice thing um, is we work closely with another organization, Polk County ECI, Early Childhood Iowa, which funds multiple programs that we are also funding. So they collect their performance measures on a fiscal half year. And we've recently transitioned to only collecting performance measures on the fiscal year. So the programs are still able to submit their data um, in the fiscal half year for uh, Polk County ECI. That data is then annualized in scorecard and then we're able to aggregate off of that. So one of the other really nice pieces. So I am going to show first um, what it looks like from the program perspective. So here we have Book Buddy, one of United Way's own programs. We also collect performance measures on our own <laughs> to make sure that we're making progress. So you can see here the number of children served. If you click on the little plus, you're able to see that historical information of how things are going. Um, and if you actually click into a measure, you can also add in trend lines, adding in or taking off data labels, however you need to. But this information then can feed up into our aggregate scorecard. So I will get that pull up. So here you're gonna see a lot more measures. So we really tried to clean up um, when we were meeting with our partners which data points really show the impact that they're making. And then with that common language, we're able to better um, 
aggregate together. So we have those shared definitions. So now you can see that the number of children that we're serving is 7,000. Um, and those screenings that we, um, Jacqueline talked about being so important for catching things earlier, um, we're able to see throughout the community how, um, how many programs are really uh, driving towards those key things. So you'll see a huge spike just because we did um, do a reset of performance measures. But if I scroll down, you can also see all of the different programs that are tracking things related to um, screenings, both developmentally, health, um, dental, that type of thing. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, we know that the work is much more than just the data that um, we are tracking and the outcomes. It really is about um, the work that's on the ground. So I am going to hand it off to Cheryl, who's going to share a little bit more about the work of our funded programs. Good morning. Um, I'm excited to share three of our integrated partnerships who are really critical in our education success work. All of them are national programs and partners also of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. The first one I'm gonna talk about is Count the Kicks. Next slide, please. Count the Kicks is an evidence-based stillbirth prevention campaign founded by five Central Iowa women who created an early warning system for expectant parents. Count the Kicks is a simple way to monitor your baby's well-being. Next slide. Count the Kicks was created in 2008. Back, please. Um, should be the very next one. Thank you. It was created in 2008, and from 2008 until 2018, there was actually a 32% reduction in the stillbirth rate in Iowa, whereas the rest of the country remained stagnant. Iowa's stillbirth rate decreased 1% every three months during that decade, and in 2021, the stillbirth rate in Iowa was the second lowest on record. In addition, Iowa saw a 39% reduction in the stillbirth rate among African-American women. Count the Kicks centers equity in everything they do and their evidence-based practices were recently honored in January, 2021 by the Association for Maternal Child Health Professionals when they named Count the Kicks an evidence-based best practice. Next slide. The hallmark tool for Count the Kicks is their free kick counting app. Note the features of the app on the screen. Again, I'd like to highlight it's free and has been downloaded over 200,000 times in 140 countries. The app does not have any ads and is a way for expectant parents to track their baby's fetal movement and to speak up to their providers if they notice a change. Next slide. While Count the Kicks started in Iowa, they have been expanding now in over 19 states with more hopefully coming on board in 2023. Please know while the app is free, there's also more that goes along with that program, such as webinars, printed materials, and trainings. And our final slide for Count the Kicks, you're going to see the faces of beautiful babies who have been saved by Count the Kicks their parents, and their health care providers. These faces across the United States prove that Count the Kicks works. In many of their stories, their doctors said they would not be here if their moms didn't speak up when she noticed a change in movement. Next, United Way of Central Iowa in 2020 teamed up with Bright by Text a national parent texting program to put expert tips, educational games, and child development education and information directly into the hands of parents and caregivers of ages children prenatal through age eight. Bright by text, messages share tips, 
short videos, and related resources from national expert partners such as Vroom, Sesame Street, and the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention. To help in their parenting journey, Bright by Text covers it all. They have text topics including brain development, learning activities, health, nutrition, tantrums, and more. The messages correspond with each child's age. Next slide. The Bright by Text content can be split into three main categories. Their core content library is tied to an expected birth due date or date of birth and covers anything that touches early childhood. Community messages are targeted by the age of the child in addition to geography. So all messages are actionable and local. And the third content category is optional, which means if a parent or caregiver has a specific concern, they can access this content in that area through curated partnerships. Next slide. That core content library starts supporting caregivers and parents during pregnancy and again ends when they turn nine years old. Bright by Text takes a holistic approach so that caregivers can receive information on all areas related to raising a child. Their content library is curated by national partners such as PBS, Cooking Matters, Special Olympics, Zero to Three, and many more. And finally, United Way of Central Iowa is also successfully utilizing the community message features on that next slide, which continually highlights opportunities and important reminders for anyone using this app. Examples have been summer meal meetups, preschool registration, free family events, and more. And our third program that we'd like to share in partnership is Vision to Learn. About one in four kids naturally need glasses, which are critical for students' educational achievement and health outcomes. As 80% of all learning during a child's first 12 years is visual. And students with uncorrected vision often suffer headaches, avoid reading, and can have trouble focusing in class. These symptoms make affected children less likely to reach important educational milestones by the end of third grade. Vision to Learn is uniquely positioned to successfully help children in underserved communities due to their mobile clinic and wide network of community partners. By bringing vision care directly to schools using a mobile clinic staffed with an optometrist and optician, they eliminate cost, time and transportation barriers for families. All children in need are helped regardless of insurance or citizenship status. By bringing eye exams and glasses directly to schools, Vision to Learn connects students to care, leading to improved educational, literacy and behavioral outcomes. Next slide. And in Des Moines, Iowa, this partnership with Vision to Learn was formed in 2017 to ensure that students have access to a critical and essential tool, a pair of glasses. Over our five-year partnership, we have deepened our work by lifting up Vision to Learn as a healthcare provider, increasing access to vision care in central Iowa. We have engaged our business community in unique ways. We partner together, partnered together on advocacy efforts while keeping the focus on improving educational and health outcomes for our Central Iowa students. And next slide is going to share our impact. The numbers say it all. And I'd like to close my section of this panel by sharing a quote from one of our latest glassing, glasses dispensing celebrations at Willard School. After putting on his new glasses for the first time, a student enthusiastically remarked, I can see my future. And on that note, I'm very happy to turn it over to one of our very important out-of-school time community partners, 
John Spinks from Oak Ridge Neighborhood Services. Take it away, John. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. As Cheryl stated, my name is John Spinks. I am a project manager uh, with Oak Ridge and our youth department. And today I'm gonna share some things with you about partnerships and how we support our young students and families. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So some of the things that we will focus on today is out of school time partnerships. And basically what that means is that uh, we do a lot of partnering with our schools, such as Edmonds our Elementary School, Calumet, our middle school, and Roosevelt High School. Next page, please. And some of the pictures that you're seeing here, uh, I want to talk about uh, what, what we're seeing when we talk about continuum of services from birth to graduation. I want to start by saying Oak Ridge um, is a community within a community. Uh, the majority of our families that we work with are refugee and English language learners. And so it's extremely important that we're there not only for their children, but also for them. Some of the pictures that you're looking at right now are um, on the bottom. Uh, we do a college tour, HBCU where our students sign up and we encourage them that once they graduate, that they continue uh, their education um, at secondary. We've also used some of the other programs that uh, Cheryl and others spoke about, such as vision. Uh, we've done eye clinics, we've done flu clinics, and we've also done uh, COVID shot clinics. Next, next slide, please. Thank you. So when we talk about wraparound services, this is uh, extremely important. Uh, and we've implemented, uh, included a lot of pictures because I think uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so when we look at all of the smiling faces with the new coats on, that's because of community partnerships. And we work with the uh, Iowa Realty Group uh, and Leela Granger uh, that came and provided coats in two different ways. So all of the students that are involved in our after school program were able to receive brand new winter coats based on a drive that they, uh, that they did. When you look at some of the other pictures, when we talk about wraparound services, uh, we have families that come into our adult and family program. We feel like it's extremely important for them to become self-sufficient that number one, they need to know how to read so they can fill out an application. We also provide citizenship classes here. We also provide driver's ed. And just recently we added a WIC clinic for parents to uh, come in and sign up for WIC to ensure that they are receiving healthy, nutritious foods for their kids. So on the very bottom there, we continue to work uh, in the schools with a lot of our parents and with school officials. Sometimes parents are really intimidated and don't feel comfortable going into the school, number one, because of language barriers, and number two, because people are saying things that they have no idea what they're talking about. And so that's where we become advocates, not only for the youth that we serve, but also the families that we're involved in. So next slide, please. Partnerships, uh, program partnerships with the Moines Public School. As you can see, uh, we've got Edmonds, Callanan, and Roosevelt. Those are our uh, three feeder schools. The picture to the top left uh, is Mr. Wright, who is our teacher. Mr. William is his uh, success navigator. And we do hire teachers uh, for our after school program and our summer uh, enrichment camp. Uh, these folks come in and they work with the students at least two to three hours a day uh, to continue uh, what they're learning uh, during the school time. We call that ex extended learning day. On the very bottom there, uh, bottom left, uh, we provided uh, reading opportunities. Uh, we went over and we worked with Edmonds uh, in the library and we were able to read 
uh, to all of the students during Black History Month, which I thought was extremely important. The photo at the top right, again, is a partnership between our Delton family, Oak Ridge and Edmonds. We sat down and we talked about it was extremely important to make sure that families got their kids, their students registered for school, and we were able to get that done uh, by using our staff that were able to translate and having parents come to a place that they felt safe and secure and that they were going to have support there. We've also done a lot to implement social emotional learning. Uh, on the bottom right photo is Dow Jock, who is also the coordinator for social emotional learning with the Moines Public School. Uh, we had a parent engagement to explain to them what social emotional learning was. We had Dow Jock come in and speak a little bit with our families about the importance of social and emotional learning. So part of my job when we talk about partnerships with Des Moines Public School is to be a conduit. And I feel like we've done that, I've done that, and it's to connect the school with the community and with the home. A lot of times parents don't feel comfortable. And so I become that conduit and either trying to get them there or making sure that there's opportunities within the Oak Ridge community where we can provide opportunities for parents to meet with school officials. Some of the things that we've done to ensure ELL students get the help that they need and parents can get to conferences, that we provided uh, a space for not only teachers and counselors from Edmonds, Callanan and Roosevelt to come actually come to our campus and work with the parents uh, of students with ELL. So next slide, please. Oh, and let's talk about our partnership with United Way. My friend Cheryl smiling on the right there. So in this picture, uh, it's extremely important. So the picture on the left, uh, you see them, the staff from uh, United Way holding some sweatshirts. One of the things that we've done uh, with our middle and high school program is you have to find different ways to engage students. And so what they've done is they've come up with an entrepreneurial program. So the students have designed and created those sweatshirts that you're seeing there. Oak Ridge has a uh, fundraiser called Jazz Jewels and Jeans. And the students actually go to those fundraisers and they sell those sweatshirts. And so I think that's a great opportunity. One of the other great things that we've done uh, with the help of United Way is we have a, a summer youth employment program. And I'm going to move away from the term summer because we're now in a position where we can offer year round employment opportunities for students, number one, who are being academically successful and who need a job. And it's extremely important to share this with you that it's not just any old job. What we do is we do a career assessment uh, with those students. And based on the areas that they're interested in, we place them with different partners throughout, uh, throughout the community. The young lady that's pictured there with Cheryl, she has actually worked with United Way for three summers. And I think in that picture, Cheryl was training her to be a book buddy uh, reader. And so that's been a great opportunity. She started at uh, United Way when she was actually 14 years old, getting ready to enter into high school. We also use some of the students to help us uh, with our after school program by going into the classroom and acting as assistants. And it's really nice because a lot of the students here have younger siblings that are involved with our after school program. So next slide, please. So data, you've heard a lot from United Way about tracking data. It's extremely important. And what we've done is we've learned to use data to inform programming and to improve and enhance programming. The little picture on the left there with the little kids, uh, one of the things that we've decided to do, uh, we track uh, because we serve uh, all grades, kindergarten through 12th grade. One of the things that we really started taking a look at, we track to see how many of our incoming kindergartners 
have actually attended a formal uh, preschool program. And then we compare that with those students who did to see how they are performing. We've got two pictures off to the right. We feel like education is extremely important. So we've connected with the Morris Public School uh, to make sure that students have access to missing assignments and that our staff has access to teachers, counselors, uh, to make sure that they inform us if our students are not performing uh, extremely well. One of the other things that we do, we provide a lot of data uh, to United Way. We use that in the form of report cards. Uh, we track attendance. Uh, we attract, uh, uh, we uh, focus on uh, behaviors because if students, number one, are not attending school, they're not gonna be successful. Number two, if they are attending school and they're not going to class, they're not gonna be successful. Number three, if they're going to school and they're constantly in the office, again, they're not gonna be successful. So part of what we do is we track all of our students who attend all three of those schools and we work with not only the building administrators, but we work with the counselors and we work with the teachers to ensure that if those students need extra help after they leave that building at 340 or 240, then we can get the materials and things that we need in order to help them be successful. So data is extremely important to us. It's not just uh, numbers, but we also take a look at that. How are our students uh, thriving? Are they getting what they really need? Do they need ELL uh, classes? Do they need extra tutoring? By hiring certified teachers to work in our after school program, we've been able to meet the needs of the students. Uh, when COVID came into play, uh, that was really hard. Uh, because of our collaboration and partnership with United Way, we were able to receive additional funding to do a number of different things. Number one, um, we felt it was extremely important when students went to virtual learning that they didn't just sit at home, that they actually came to some place where they had adult supervision and they had support because having them sit at home, a lot of times parents had no idea of how to use a computer or what they were focusing on. We actually did 10 hour days. Fern Johnson and I would get here at about 6.30 in the morning. If school started at 7.15 or 7.20, we had those students in the building, in their seats with their computers on in order to get their uh, academics done for that day. Um, it was a long stretch, but there were really some positive things that came out of COVID. And I know people think that's crazy, but uh, we were one of very few programs uh, in the city of Des Moines that actually did not shut down over COVID. We came up with a plan to provide a safe, clean learning environment that allowed us to continue to work with those students uh, to make sure that they were successful during those times. So, and I'm not sure if this is my last slide uh, or not, but data is extremely important. So. So with that, next slide, please. So with that, I will uh, flip it to Kate. Thank you. Thank you, John. Obviously, um, we are so blessed at United Way of Central Iowa to work with John and many other great partners like him. And obviously, our team here is wonderful and very knowledgeable. Um, hopefully you got just a little bit of a glimpse of that today. So of course I feel um, so fortunate and blessed to work with each of them every day. It's hard to imagine we even have any next steps after what you heard today, right? Um, but we do, we're always learning and growing. I would say something hopefully you heard as a theme throughout is that our evolution to United to Thrive is ongoing. And so I think for all of us, um, although we have great definition around our core elements and um, some of the data that we wanna collect and the fact that we wanna overtly focus on inequities, how does that all come together and how do we do that um, and communicate it internally and externally? So that's an ongoing next step. 
We also want to strengthen our data usage and support our partners to use data. Um, Oak Ridge is one of the leaders in using data. They've always been wonderful about it. Some of our new and emerging partners that Mary referenced that we brought on are not. And so we want to provide everyone that opportunity to be able to use data to strengthen their programs and communicate to other funders. We want to obviously continue to engage new partners because we know in order to meet, meet, meet the needs of the most vulnerable communities in our community, we need to always be looking for new partners, um, new agencies, new programs that are working with partners that are unknown to us or working with partners that are known to us, but in a different way. And this is just something that's overall going on in our education space. And Mary sort of alluded to it as we transition from the goal focused solely on education, but in our United to Thrive, we're focusing not only on graduation, but graduating with a plan. And I would say that's true for all of our elements in United to Thrive. It's just what takes it farther than it did um, when it was the goals for 2020. And I think we're all learning that and how do we measure that and how do we communicate that? So um, yeah, those are some of our next steps. Thank you all for listening. And I think we're getting pretty close on time. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate. Um, I just wanna acknowledge this team. Um, there's been so much information and uh, resources that have been shared. And so for those of you who are still uh, tuned in and listening with us, I will absolutely share everything in the follow-up guide that will come um, later this week. So be uh, tuned into that. Um, also, uh, Sierra, we have a couple of uh, other webinars that are coming up. So I would like to draw uh, your attention to those. We have one um, that's coming this afternoon. Oops, my apologies. I've been muted this whole time here. I've been talking and talking. Uh, thank you so much. I uh, just want to want to say um, thank you to the United Way uh, of Central Iowa team um, for all of your work and for uh, the resources that you have shared um, throughout this session. All of these resources will be shared in the follow-up um, guide that will be coming out later this week. Uh, we also have um, some other sessions that are coming up later this month. Um, I will put in the chat, um, links to uh, register for these. We have one this afternoon uh, at three o'clock, a uh, very powerful session um, that we'll be uh, talking about um, how we will be able to seize opportunities uh, using some of the uh, funding uh, that is available. And so uh, please uh, register for these sessions that are coming soon. Uh, also, I want to say a happy new year and happy holidays to everybody. Hard to believe that 2022 is coming to a close. I just so appreciate all of your time. And uh, we We'll end our session today and gift you back uh, four minutes. So thank you so much to everyone who is able to join us today. Thank you.